Hi everyone, Casey here. Welcome back to my channel, Casey on Location. In this video, I will show you how I set up my home studio for creating videos. So hopefully you will get some inspiration here if you are trying to set up your own studio. Your own setup may be different than mine, which will depend on the type of space you have, what equipment you have, and what you are trying to achieve for your own video content. So let's get started and I will discuss my 12-step guide for how I create YouTube content using the space and equipment that I have. Step number one is to create a useful topic with good content. Before doing anything else, I first come up with a concrete idea about my video topic and content. So before I start to do video, it usually takes me a few days to prepare an outline to make sure I include relevant points from start to finish that I think viewers will find useful to solve a problem or to improve on something. Having a detailed outline helps to make sure I don't forget to include something important and it helps me to stay on track. Creating an organized outline takes extra time in the beginning, but it makes for a more efficient workflow later on when I'm actually creating the video. So I highly recommend others to do the same. Step number two is to find a suitable space for setting up your studio. The space I'm using takes up about one third of my living room. I would say the actual filming space used measures about eight feet by 10 feet. So I don't really have a lot of space, but it's enough for my needs. Fortunately, my ceiling is high enough to place studio lights on tall light stands for good lighting. So having high ceilings is definitely a plus. The main piece of equipment in the center of my home studio is a computer workstation desk, which I added camera and lighting gear so I can use the space for working and filming. I'm using the autonomous smart desk, extra large, 73 inch wide electric sit standing desk. So I have lots of space on the desk for all my computer equipment, plus audio recording and microphone gear. Fortunately, I don't need to tear down and set up again after each video. The only thing I put away when I'm finished are my cameras, which I leave resting on a tripod. For your own studio setup, you want to find a space that is large enough for setting up all your equipment and to have room to film yourself, plus leave some space between you and the background to add depth and separation. It's also a good idea to find a space that is quiet to avoid unwanted background noise in the audio. Ideally, I would prefer to use a room that has no windows, so I don't need to worry about distracting bright sunlight coming through the windows that will mess up the exposure. However, for my own background, it's actually a tall window in the living room that looks out into a garden courtyard. The sunlight that comes through the window causes unwanted backlighting that creates problems for exposure and color balance. My solution for fixing that problem is to install 100% blackout curtains that blocks out the sunlight and I also roll down the window curtain which is the white background that you see behind me. So if you have windows in your room that is causing unwanted sunlight glare, you might consider installing 100% blackout curtains like I did. The blackout curtain that blocks out the window light is very useful to maintain consistent exposure and color balance. Step number three is choosing the right camera body for filming. I use two different cameras for filming videos. The camera I'm using for demonstration is the Canon 90D DSLR with interchangeable lenses. I also use the Canon Vixia G60 camcorder with a built-in zoom lens. I like both cameras for different reasons, but for this video I will mainly concentrate on the Canon 90D camera because I know most people use this type of camera, whereas fewer people use a camcorder. I like the Canon 90D camera for filming for several important reasons. The first reason is for the three inch touch screen LCD screen that can swivel out and rotate so I can see myself to check for good composition, accurate focusing, good exposure, and check the audio decibel scale to make sure I'm recording at a good level. However, if your own camera does not offer a built-in swivel screen, you can attach an external monitor such as this Feel World F6 5.5 inch monitor. This external monitor costs around $180 and makes it easier for me to create videos because I can see everything better with a larger screen size. The second reason is for the built-in microphone and headphone port. It's very important to have a microphone port so I can connect an external microphone for much better audio quality to record my voice. If a camera does not offer a microphone port, it's useless to me. Also, having a headphone port is very useful so I can monitor and check my audio to make sure I have a good signal that is not too high nor too low. 
by using the camera headphone port, I am able to make sure the audio is perfect for filming a segment before moving on to filming the next segment. And by the way, if your camera does not offer a built-in headphone port, you can use the Feel World external monitor I mentioned because that monitor has a built-in headphone port for you to insert headphones for monitoring the audio. The third reason is for the camera's accurate dual pixel face tracking and eye tracking autofocusing. It's reassuring to know that the camera will automatically track my face and eyes throughout the video even if I'm moving around. Having sharp focus on myself as the primary subject is very important. Most all current Canon camera bodies offer dual pixel autofocusing. I like the confidence of seeing the green focusing bracket on my face and eyes on the LCD screen that tells me I am perfectly in focus. The fourth reason is for the accurate skin colors and skin tone that Canon cameras are known for. I appreciate that the colors coming out of the Canon cameras are accurate, so I don't need to spend extra time doing post-processing for color correction. However, with that said, I still prefer to do a manual gray card white balance preset instead of relying on the camera's automatic white balance, which I will discuss more later on how to do a gray card white balance. If you have never done a custom white balance preset before, you really should do that because you will see a noticeable improvement for color accuracy. I will discuss this more later when I talk about lighting gear. The fifth reason is for the 4K resolution quality for videos. I can tell you that for filming in 4K resolution is much better than 1080p quality. 4K quality is not a total necessity, but I can really appreciate the extra sharpness and details that 4K resolution offers. I also think that the YouTube algorithm gives preference to 4K videos, and I'm pretty sure that viewers can appreciate the difference. Filming in 4K quality requires more computer storage and computer processing power, so it's important to have plenty of external storage drive, including RAM memory for rendering 4K video files. At a minimum, your computer should have 500 terabytes of fast SSD drive and at least 16 gigabytes of RAM memory for your video editing software to run smoothly. So to summarize, what type of camera you choose to use does make a difference. A camera with the right features will make it easier for you to create videos, but a camera that is lacking the right features will make it more difficult for you. So given a choice, it's just better to use a camera that has the right stuff for filming. With all those features that I consider important, that's why I like the Canon 90D camera. This is a mid-level camera that can get the job done without costing too much. For around $1,200 for the body only, this camera has all the features that I want for creating videos, Plus, the camera works equally well for taking still pictures. Just to cover my bases, I should probably mention any potential downsides of the camera. So, no, the Canon 90D is not a full-frame camera body. No, it's not a mirrorless camera body either. No, it doesn't shoot 8K video. No, this camera can't film at ISO 200,000 under a single candlelight. And no, it's not the top-of-the-line Canon 1DX Mark whatever body. It is not a Canon cinema camera nor a RED 8K camera, nor an Aerie Alexa. It's simply an affordable 32 megapixel APS-C camera body that gets the job done and has all the important features that I need that makes it easier for creating video content without spending more than I need to. By the way, my other favorite camera for filming is the Canon Vixia G60 4K camcorder with a large full-frame 1-inch sensor that shoots super high-quality 4K videos and that's the camera I'm using now to film this video. The Canon G60 camcorder costs around $1,700, and I like using this camcorder because there is no 30-minute time limit for filming, whereas the 90D camera and most other DSLR cameras have that 30-minute time limit for videos. So using the Canon G60 camcorder is ideal for filming long video content for when I need to film events, such as speaker presentations that can last for many hours. Also, the Canon G60 has amazingly sharp autofocusing, plus the camcorder offers adjustable speed for smooth autofocusing and lens zooming. I wish my Canon 90D could have the same variable speed preset for smooth autofocusing and zooming. The Canon G60 camcorder even has great in-body image stabilization for when I'm filming handheld, and I can film with the camcorder easily for many hours without worrying about overheating. Plus, it has two memory card slots for either redundant recording for backup in case one memory card fails or relay recording so when one memory card is full 
the second memory card is automatically used to continue filming. Also, the G60 camcorder even comes with a super handy remote control for starting and stopping a video clip, plus autofocusing and even zooming the built-in lens from wide angle to telephoto, all at a touch of a button. I use the remote control constantly for starting and stopping a video segment before moving on to the next segment. I also use a remote control for the Canon 90D. It's the Canon BRE1 remote control. It's a $40 optional accessory and I highly recommend getting the Canon remote control. The reason a remote control is useful is so I can be in my seat and press the start button for filming. Otherwise, if I don't have a remote control, that means I need to physically go to the camera and press the shutter button to start the film, and then go back to the camera to press the shutter button again to stop the video. So without a remote control, that means I need to spend extra time in the video editing software to edit out the first couple seconds of starting the video and edit out the last couple seconds of stopping the video. And because I am filming many segments that need to be stitched together in post, that means a lot of extra editing for each segment. That's why it's really useful to have a remote control for starting and stopping a video so you don't need to physically press the shutter button on the camera. And by the way, a pro tip is to make sure you buy extra batteries for the remote control so you don't have to run out to Walgreens store to replace dead batteries in the middle of filming. I've been there and done that myself. Step number four is choosing the right camera lens for filming. For the Canon 90D camera, I have various Canon lenses that I can use, but my one favorite lens is the Canon 17-55 f2.8 zoom lens, which offers a fast f2.8 aperture throughout the entire focal range. I really dislike slow variable aperture zoom lenses. That's why I appreciate this lens has a fixed f2.8 aperture design. The lens also has quiet, fast, and accurate autofocusing when combined with the Canon 90D camera's reliable dual pixel autofocusing feature. I also usually have the zoom lens set for about 28 millimeter focal length for filming my videos with the camera four feet away. Because the Canon 90D camera is not full frame and has a 1.5x crop factor, that means a 28 millimeter focal length is roughly equivalent to 42 millimeters, which makes for a moderate wide angle coverage. I highly recommend the Canon 17-55 f2.8 zoom lens, which offers built-in image stabilization and is versatile for both shooting stills and videos. This is not the top-of-the-line L-series Canon lens, but I find the lens to be just as fast and sharp as my Canon L-series lenses. The 17-55mm focal range means I can shoot moderate wide-angle coverage, plus I can also shoot close-up portraits. At 55 millimeters with the 1.5x multiplier, that equals approximately 82 millimeters, which is a decent moderate telephoto length for shooting portraits. If you are using a zoom lens, you should consider getting a fast f2.8 constant aperture zoom, which allows for more light and shallower depth of field to blur out the background if you want to. So for less than $1,000, I highly recommend this fast and versatile zoom lens paired with the Canon 90D body, which is great for shooting stills and videos. Step number five is using an external microphone for better audio. As you may already know from my other videos, I consider audio to be highly important for creating video content. I will post a link to my other video that I created for how to achieve better voice audio using an external microphone for filming. For myself, I personally favor using a wireless lavalier microphone system whereby I have a wireless transmitter clipped below my collar and the wireless receiver is connected to the camera. Using a wireless lav mic, especially one that offers adjustable gain levels, offers me the best combination of audio quality and versatility. I really do not like using wired microphones because I can get tangled up with the cable and it limits my movement. So using a wireless lav microphone means I can easily move around and still maintain consistent voice recording level, even if the camera is farther away from me. My favorite wireless lavalier microphones are the Rode Wireless Go or the Ceramonic Wireless System. Both the tiny Rode Wireless microphone or the full-sized Ceramonic Wireless mic offer adjustable gain levels, which is important for higher clean decibel gain. Having adjustable clean gain level settings is a huge plus. So as mentioned in detail from my other video, 
It's important to go into the camera's recording level menu and change the setting from automatic to manual. Then I manually adjust the recording level to no higher than the halfway mark at 50 or even lower to around 25 or 35. Reducing the camera's recording level helps to reduce any potential electronic background noise caused by the camera's preamp. The camera recording level setting I choose will depend on which wireless lav microphone I use and what microphone gain adjustment the wireless receiver will be set for. That means I will do a combination of reducing the setting on the camera's recording level plus raising the wireless receiver gain level in order to achieve between negative 6 to negative 12 decibel on the camera's decibel scale. That's how I will know my voice recording level is set perfectly. What is also very important is to never use the camera's built-in microphone for filming because that will sound terrible for many reasons. Always use an external microphone connected to the camera for better voice audio. You don't have to spend a lot for a top-of-the-line microphone. Even a simple $20 wire lavalier microphone clipped to your collar will provide much better voice audio compared to only using the camera's built-in microphone. Again, I will link the other video I created that gives a detailed explanation for why it's important to use an external microphone and how I set the audio gain level for my wireless lavalier microphone to achieve great results. Step number six is lighting equipment for filming. I use multiple off-camera LED lights to make sure everything I'm filming has good lighting. I prefer to use external LED lights because I'm able to control the exposure for consistent lighting throughout the video. I don't want to be at the mercy of window lighting whereby the sunlight will change throughout the day when the sun is rising or setting so I never rely on window lighting from the sun because I want consistent LED lighting throughout the day. My favorite lighting gear is made by Godox. I have a variety of Godox brand lights for still photography and videos. The light I am using is called the Godox SL60W. This AC powered light puts out 60 watts of accurate daylight balance output. The Godox SL60W light has a built-in Bowens mount whereby I have a 26 inch Fotix Raha 65 circular softbox attached with a honeycomb grid for soft directional lighting. Having a decent large size circular softbox that is positioned close to me is important because that will give me soft lighting with natural looking circular catch lights in my eyes instead of squared catch lights from a squared shaped softbox. Also the included honeycomb grid that comes with the Fotix Raha softbox provides diffused directional lighting so I don't get any unwanted light spill going in all directions. I can tell you that using a decent sized circular softbox with a honeycomb grid that is positioned off camera on a light stand nearby me will provide 100 times better lighting compared to any on camera light. A good sized softbox light is also better than any ring light because a ring light is usually small in size between 6 to 12 inches and therefore puts out harsh lighting that causes large unnatural looking catch lights in your eyes. So the important thing to keep in mind for good lighting is to use a decently large sized light modifier such as a circular softbox that is positioned close to you no more than a few feet away. Conversely, a small light that is positioned farther away from you will create harsh lighting with hard shadows, so that is something you want to avoid. So for the best lighting, you want to use a larger sized light modifier that is off camera and is positioned close to you. The Godox SL60W light that I'm using is extremely well made and reliable. I often have it running for many hours with no problem. The light even comes with a handy remote control so I can adjust the brightness level and remotely change the wireless groups and channels for multiple lighting setup. I have two of the same Godox lights whereby one is the primary light with a softbox attached and is placed about 3 feet to my right of the camera and is about 3 feet away from me. The reason I have the light placed a few feet away from the side of the camera is to provide modeling on my face whereby one side of my face is mainly lit and the other side of my face has shadow to create a three dimensional effect. The main light is about two feet higher than my head and angled downwards. It's important to have the primary light a little higher than my head so that the light is casting a shadow below my chin and neck which is flattering but I do not want the light too high to the point I'm missing catch lights in my eyes. You want to position the height of the main light so that the light is still reflecting in your eyes as catch lights. 
If there are no catch lights in your eyes, that means the lights are placed too high and you need to lower them until you can see the reflection of the lights in your eyes. Again, you want to make sure that your eyes are showing catch lights. Otherwise, if there are no catch lights, your eyes look dead and lifeless, which you want to avoid. Additionally, I sometimes have the softbox swiveled away from my face so that the edge of the light from the softbox is lighting my face instead of the light from the center of the softbox. This is called feathering the light, which makes for softer lighting that is even more flattering. My other second Godox SL60W light is used as a fill light and is placed right behind the camera on a 9 feet tall light stand. The second fill light simply has the reflector bowl attached and pointed forward at the ceiling at a 45 degree angle for bounced lighting to lighten up the shadow on the other side of my face. My ceiling and walls are all white color, so bouncing the second light on the ceiling provides overall even lighting and makes the lighting less contrasty, which I prefer. For exposure values, I usually have the main light set for one f-stop higher than the fill light, so conversely that means the fill light is set for one f-stop lower. So for example, I have the main light with the softbox outputting about f4.0 exposure at ISO 800. For the second light as bounced fill lighting, the exposure value is about f2.8. The actual exposure I'm using for the camera is f4.5 at 1 60th of a second at ISO 800 while shooting in full manual exposure mode. If I need extended depth of field to show more background detail, I will increase the power on the main light so I can stop down to f5.6 and have the second fill light at f4.0. I generally shoot at ISO 800, but I can easily go higher to ISO 1600, which is no problem for the cameras I'm using. Sometimes I will decrease the lighting power to open up to f2.8 lens aperture if I want shallower depth of field. I know that shooting at f1.4 or 2.8 for that dreamy blurry background is all the rage nowadays, but for most of my videos, I generally need more depth of field to show background detail so I don't usually shoot wide open even though I can if I want to. Regarding lighting ratios, some photographers prefer more dramatic lighting using a 3 to 1 or even a 4 to 1 lighting ratio. That type of lighting creates strong split lighting on the face. That high contrast lighting was made popular on the old Marlboro cigarette billboard pictures, whereby the macho cowboy with his 10 gallon cowboy hat looks extra masculine. So I'm guessing high contrast lighting is great for Madison Avenue advertising for selling cigarettes, but not so great for lighting my own face. Also, using high ratios for lighting women is usually not flattering, so I would avoid that. So just stick to using a moderate 2 to 1 lighting ratio, whereby the main light on your face is 1 f-stop brighter and the fill light on your face is 1 f-stop lower. That's what I call safe and flattering lighting for most people. Your mileage will vary, of course. As for the background light, I'm using the compact Viltrox L116T light panel that has an adjustable bicolor warm to daylight temperature. I usually have the background light outputting about f4.5 exposure to match the combined exposure for the main light and fill light. I sometimes have the background light set to 4000 degrees Kelvin temperature to output a warm amber color to light the white curtain background behind me. The warm color light helps to add depth and separation from me and the background. And I like the warm tone color. I think it adds a nice touch to the background. But if I want daylight color, then I can set the Viltrox light to 5500 degrees Kelvin to match the main light and fill light. The Viltrox light is also important to eliminate shadows on the background caused by the main light. Otherwise, the main light would cast a shadow of my head onto the background, which I'm trying to avoid. So to summarize, I use a combination of a main light with a softbox within 3 feet away from me, plus a fill light right behind the camera and bouncing off the ceiling, and a background light to separate me from the background. I find this triple lighting setup offers a pleasing 3D effect, which looks way better than using only one light on camera that produces flat lighting. Flat lighting is visually boring and is generally reserved for TV news anchors on the 10 o'clock nightly news. 
Also, direct on-camera lighting causes unwanted light reflections on my glasses, which looks bad, so that's another reason to use off-camera lighting to help reduce the reflection. Also, I should point out that if you are using two lights in front of you, you want to make sure you do not have two separate lights placed to the left and right of the camera at equal brightness power. That type of lighting setup will create cross shadows on your nose, whereby there are two separate shadows from your nose on the left and right side of your face. That type of lighting looks terrible, so you need to make sure one light is the fill light and is set for lower power versus the main light to avoid unwanted double shadows on your face. Also, for accurate exposure reading, I usually use a light meter. My preferred light meter is the Sekonic 308XU because it's very compact and easy to use. I normally take a separate light measurement reading for the main light and a separate reading for the fill light to make sure the main light is one stop brighter than the fill light. Then I take another measurement that combines both the main and fill light together and that will be the actual exposure value that I will use for the camera settings which is usually around f4.5. Lastly, I take a separate light measurement for the background light and will set the brightness level to match the main light to avoid shadows on the background behind me. So to summarize, I really like the Godox SL60W LED lights, which offers excellent quality lighting at a budget price of only $135. The only potential disadvantage of using these lights is that it is strictly wall AC powered, so you cannot use it remotely on location. If you need an LED light with a rechargeable built-in battery for on-location filming, Godox makes other models at a higher price for using the light remotely. So the bottom line is that you do not need to spend $800 for the legendary Aperture 120D light that every famous YouTuber is saying is the best. I'm sure the Aperture 120D light is excellent, but you are paying much more because that Aperture light includes a rechargeable battery so you can use that light remotely on location. But if you are simply filming videos in a fixed location in your home studio, then spending only $135 for the Godox SL60W light plus extra for a good softbox will provide great lighting that is cost effective. You can thank me later for that cost saving pro tip. Step number seven is using a gray card for custom white balance preset. While we are still on the topic of lighting, the next useful thing to do is to use a gray card for doing a custom white balance preset. Doing this method means more accurate colors, including accurate skin tones, compared to using the automatic white balance setting. Anytime you have your camera set for automatic white balance, that means you are allowing the camera to decide what should be the correct colors based on the lighting used. As a result, the colors might shift throughout the video, which is a problem. But if you do a custom white balance preset, your skin tone and colors will be accurate and consistent throughout the entire video, as long as you're using the same lighting setup. So whenever possible, do not use the auto white balance on your camera. Always use the custom white balance preset based on a gray card reading for the light that is exposing your face. Let me explain how to do a custom white balance preset. The first thing is to switch to still shooting mode on the camera. The 18% gray card that I am using only costs $12 and has a folding design that is very compact. I place the gray card next to my face and have the gray card pointed in front of the camera lens and make sure the main light is evenly lighting the gray card for where I am positioned in front of the camera. Then I have the camera lens zoomed out so that the gray card entirely fills the frame in camera and make sure the magnified image of the gray card is sharply in focus. Then I take a still picture of the gray card. Next, I switch to video shooting mode on the camera and go to the camera menu for custom white balance and choose that gray card still image as the custom preset. Now my camera is ready for filming using that gray card image as the custom white balance based on the lighting setup I'm using. Using this gray card white balance method will ensure that my skin tone and overall colors will be accurate and consistent. This method only takes two minutes to do, and I can almost guarantee that you will be pleased with the results. And with practice, you will get better and faster at doing this. 
In summary, always keep a gray card in your camera bag for better color accuracy straight out of the camera. I should also point out that if your lighting setup changes or you take your camera to a different location such as outdoors, you will need to redo the entire process because the original preset was only valid for the previous lighting setup. For myself, I usually do not use LUTs or color grading in post-processing. I rely on accurate colors coming straight out of my Canon cameras. And by doing a simple custom white balance preset before I start filming, this will ensure that I have accurate colors and skin tone. So I highly recommend that you do the same for better colors. Step number eight is to do a short test video to make sure everything is perfect. So after I have everything set up for my camera, lighting, microphone, and custom white balance, I am almost ready to start filming. Next thing I will do is film a short test clip so I can download to the computer to make sure everything is perfect for both video and audio. It's best to have headphones on to make sure the audio is perfect and to make sure there is no unwanted background humming or hissing noise. If there is anything wrong with the test video, you can then make corrections and shoot another test video to make sure everything is perfect before you start filming. Sometimes I will cheat and simply film a short test clip and play it back on the camera using the external 5.5 inch monitor with headphones on. And if the video and audio check out okay, I will then continue on for the actual filming. But if you are new to making videos, I recommend that you do a short video test clip first and download the test video to your computer for review to make sure everything checks out okay before continuing further. Sometimes you will miss something that is wrong if you are only checking the small LCD screen on the camera, but you can better check for problems using your computer with a larger screen and with headphones on. As you get better at doing this, you can simply do a quick check on the camera LCD screen, preferably using a larger external monitor connected to the camera and with headphones plugged in to make sure everything is fine. Step number nine is to start filming and shoot smaller multiple segments. So what exactly do I mean by shooting smaller multiple segments? This only applies for making long videos, especially how-to type of videos. For videos that I create that include content with many different categories, the entire finished video might last 30 to 40 minutes long. I can tell you that it's impossible for me to create a long 30 minute video in one single clip with no cuts in between. So to make it easier on myself, I break up the video into smaller segments. The first segment is my introduction, whereby I say, hello everyone, thanks for visiting my channel. That intro usually takes only a couple minutes and I normally speak a few short sentences. I might have to do a few retakes until I'm satisfied with the segment because maybe I'm saying the wrong words or I'm getting tongue tied or whatever. After reviewing a finished segment, if I'm satisfied by watching the replay using the larger feel world external monitor with headphones on, then I will continue on to the next segment. By the time I'm all done filming the entire video, I might have anywhere from 30 to 40 different segment clips that I need to stitch together in the video editing software. I find that filming multiple smaller segments that I can later combine together in post-processing is easier versus trying to film one long video in a single clip and constantly making mistakes throughout the entire video. That is just frustrating. So after filming my intro clip, then the next segment that I normally film is the ending outro clip and say something like, thanks for watching my video, please like and subscribe and see you again next time. So you might ask yourself, why am I filming the ending segment immediately after filming the introduction? That makes no sense. Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's the reason why. Sometimes the video I'm creating takes longer to finish than I expected because I'm making lots of mistakes and doing many retakes for each segment. As a result, it ends up taking two or three days of filming because I can't finish everything in the same day. Therefore, if it takes me three days to finish filming all the many different segments, I want to make sure that the starting segment and the ending segment look consistently the same in terms of lighting and composition, including the way I look and even the clothing that I'm wearing. 
Otherwise, it would look strange that my outro ending segment looks different than when you first saw me at the start of the video because I filmed the last outro segment on a different day. So that's another bonus pro tip you might try yourself if you think it will take you longer than one day to finish filming a video. So after I finish filming the starting intro segment and then do the ending outro segment, I then continue in normal order of what I want to film next until I finish everything on my outline. I never really know exactly how many segments I end up filming because many times I will make changes along the way as I'm filming. I might think to myself, dang, I forgot to include something important, so I will add an extra segment on the spot. Or sometimes I get frustrated while filming a long segment that is causing me grief and I decide it makes more sense to split the one segment into two separate clips to make it easier for filming. By the time I'm done with all the filming, I usually end up with a couple hundred video clips whereby most of them are rejects because I kept doing multiple retakes until I was satisfied with a segment before moving on to the next segment. For example, out of 150 separate clips recorded, I might end up using only 20 to 30 of those clips that I'm satisfied with, while all the other clips are rejects that get trashed. Step number 10 is to create a thumbnail picture that describes the video. It's important to create a thumbnail that I like that will adequately describe the video that I am posting to YouTube. Otherwise, if I do not proactively create my own thumbnail picture for posting my YouTube video, then YouTube will do it for me. YouTube usually gives me a few different choices of thumbnail pictures that YouTube thinks is a good fit. Sometimes one of the thumbnail choices that YouTube gives is decent, but other times all the choices are terrible. But if I choose nothing, then YouTube will decide on its own to add whatever thumbnail picture onto my video. That thumbnail picture might look horrible. That's why it's important that I create my own thumbnail picture that I like and insert that custom made thumbnail picture to my video. So for yourself, at some point during the video making process, it's important to take a still image that you like for the video thumbnail picture. The thumbnail picture might include your face and a product, or you don't even need to include your face. For my own videos, many times my thumbnail pictures only show equipment with a caption title added. So the choice is entirely up to you. I'm simply letting you know that it's important to create your own custom made thumbnail picture, otherwise YouTube will do it for you, which you might like or you might hate. That's why it's better to be proactive and create your own thumbnail picture that you like to use. Lastly, you need to keep in mind that YouTube will add a timestamp at the bottom right corner of your video that shows how long is your video in minutes and seconds. That means you need to leave some unimportant dead space at the bottom right of the thumbnail picture. Make sure you do not include any caption title at the bottom right corner of your thumbnail picture because YouTube will add a white color timestamp at that spot. Step number 11 is editing and importing clips into the video editing app for processing. I used to dread using video editing apps when I first started out because so many of them look crazy complicated. I installed many different video editing software because I kept searching for something that was easy to use with features that I like. I finally settled on using CyberLink PowerDirector Ultimate 18. My reasons for choosing the PowerDirector app is that it has more than enough features that I need and it's pretty easy to use. Also important is that I did not want to pay a monthly subscription fee to use an app. I prefer to pay a one-time cost for a lifetime license. That means software such as Adobe Premiere Pro, which I know is the king of the hill when it comes to video editing, is a non-starter for me because I simply don't want to pay a monthly subscription fee to use Adobe software. So with CyberLink PowerDirector app, I was able to pay a one-time cost of $130 and I own the lifetime license for using the app. So that was a very compelling reason for my decision making to choose that software. So after I finish filming, I then go through all the many video clips to filter out the ones to keep and place those in a new folder. As mentioned, I usually end up with around 30 to 40 segment clips that are keepers and all the other ones are rejects. I then figure out what chronological order each clip should be shown in the finished video. So for example, the very first intro segment is numbered 01 plus a title. 
Then the next segment in order is numbered 0, 2, and so forth until I number the very last segment, which is the outro ending clip. Then I import all the numbered clips into the PowerDirector video editing app and combine them all in chronological order. For each segment clip, I check to see if there's any dead space for one or two seconds at the starting or ending of each clip that I need to edit out. Sometimes I may have pressed the remote control button to stop a video too late, which caused a couple seconds of dead space that I need to edit out. That's why I need to review every segment to make sure there is no dead space at the starting or ending of each clip before I combine all the segments together. Next thing I do is to add effects, such as caption titles or insert a still picture here and there, and I may add a short video clip onto the segment as B-roll footage to provide more information. I usually don't add any transitions in between each segment. Other times, I need to add MP3 audio files in post-sync to replace the original audio, such as when I'm demonstrating what my voice sounds like coming from a certain microphone. In total, it usually takes me a couple of days of post-processing with the video editing software until I'm satisfied with the final result. Once I'm satisfied with all the editing, I then render the video into an MPEG-4 file, which is a long process that takes at least a few hours to finish because the video was filmed in large 4K resolution. The finished video is usually a large file that takes up a lot of space on my hard drive. So when I'm totally finished with the project, I normally offload all the files to an external hard drive for storage. It's best to always do redundant backup of your files in multiple locations in case something goes wrong. For example, keep a backup of all your files in one location plus another backup using Dropbox cloud storage or to a different physical location. Step number 12 is uploading the finished video to YouTube. So after I finish rendering the video, it's time to upload to my YouTube channel. There is various information I need to enter when posting the new video, such as adding a title and description. You can only add a short sentence for the YouTube title because there is a limited number of characters in the title line. You also need to add a description because that is required, so I usually add a few paragraphs describing what the video is about. I also add a comment and make sure it's pinned so that my comment remains at the very top of all the other comments posted. In my pinned comment, I usually have information such as product links for equipment mentioned in the video in case anyone wants to order the same items. So I hope you found this video helpful for your own journey for creating a studio space for making video content. I've been doing photography for many years and I enjoy diving into the details and talking about photography and equipment. I hope I was able to provide some useful tips and tricks for you to set up your own studio for creating video content. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below and I will try to answer them. Please like and subscribe to my channel to see more content in the future and I'll see you again next time.